Let's talk about Turkey and why it could be at a turning point. For the last 20 years, this man, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has been running the country. He's this huge political figure, someone who's inspired a lot of support and a lot of criticism. The country is deeply divided and elections are coming up, which could be Erdogan's biggest test yet. It's a kind of uh, take it or leave it or make it or break it kind of moment. Opposition parties have united behind one candidate to take on Erdogan. The opposition picked maybe its least charismatic candidate, but the one that also checks boxes in terms of getting the support of a wide cross-section of society. So what exactly is the choice voters are facing? Why is the opposition looking stronger than it has in a long time? And remember, Turkey is still dealing with the aftermath of those devastating earthquakes. So how might that affect the vote? On May 14th, people in Turkey will vote for a president and a new parliament. More on that later. In the presidential contest, Erdogan, the current president, is up against Kemal Kilic Darolu. They're the two main candidates. Now it takes 50% of the vote plus one to win. Otherwise, it'll go to a second round. And this is why it's important to make political alliances. Erdogan's got his AK party and the nationalist MHP on side plus another smaller party. That's the People's Alliance. Kilic Darolu is the leader of the main opposition party, the CHP, and he's got the support of five other parties. They make up the Nation Alliance. Some people refer to this coalition as the Table of Six. There are leftist parties, there are right-wing parties, Islamist parties, nationalist parties together. And Kılıç now is the candidate of this unified opposition. He's been in politics a long time and has actually run against Erdogan three times before, but has always lost. Kılıç is the antithesis of President Erdogan. While President Erdogan has this macho uh, way of ruling, Kılıç is more soft-spoken, he's a sort of compromising figure. But this is what he is positioning as his strength. He uh, says that the country is too divided and that he would be the uniter. Now, to understand Turkey's divisions, we need to look at the bigger picture. Turkey has always been shaped by its unique location, right between Europe and the Middle East. The vast majority of people are Muslim, but secularism, this idea of separating religion from state, is one of the main principles of Turkey's constitution. That goes back a hundred years to when the modern state of Turkey was established by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. And Atatürk wanted the country to have more of a Western outlook and brought in European-style secularism. But over time, it also led to a situation where many conservative and religious people felt really marginalized and excluded from public life. For example, for many years, women weren't allowed to wear headscarves in government offices or universities. But things changed when the AK Party came onto the scene. It was founded by Erdogan in the late 1990s. It's a conservative party with roots in political Islam, the AK Party swept to power in the early 2000s, and Erdogan became prime minister. It was the start of a new political era. I think throughout the 90s and 2000s, the primary driving force in Turkish politics was the secular versus conservative divide. The old Kemalist ideology, which was staunchly secular and in some sense uh, tried to push out conservative and Islamist politics versus Erdogan, who promised not just a place for conservatives in Turkey and its political and public space, but also said he would uh, do it in a democratic framework. Now that secular versus conservative divide still exists in many ways but it doesn't necessarily translate into a political choice as clearly or predictably as it used to. Secularists are no longer the, uh, the, the hardline Kemalists that they used to be excluding conservatives from public space or, or from politics. 
And that shift is clearer than ever in this election, where, for example, you have secularists and religious conservatives teaming up in Kilic Darolu's coalition. This makes things harder for Erdogan, even though he's still got a strong base, around 30% of the population who will probably vote for him no matter what. There is a, a large constituency here in Turkey uh, which is quite happy with Erdogan and he, he, they think that if he leaves the power, uh, they will also lose the gains. Erdogan certainly has a very committed base, but that's been shrinking. Turkish conservatives do not blindly vote for AKP anymore. And that's also where other issues come into play, like the economy, which is tanking. Now, during his early years in power, Erdogan really transformed the economy, and that was part of his appeal. In the 2000s, there was an economic boom that lifted many into the middle classes. Erdogan also revalued Turkey's currency, which helped to bring decades of high inflation under control. But in the last few years, the economy has been pretty much disastrous. Now, the backdrop is a range of pressures, like all the security problems because of the war in neighboring Syria, the impact of taking in 3.6 million Syrian refugees, and the pandemic. But there's also been Erdogan's decision to prioritize cutting interest rates, which has got a lot of criticism from economists and spooked the markets. Turkey's currency, the lira, has crashed. People's savings are worth just one-tenth of what they were a decade ago. And inflation has soared. It's come down a bit recently, but it's still over 50% year on year, and everyone is feeling it. Enflasyon evvel 100 lira sattığımız bir şey oldu 500 lira. Tabii böyle olunca da Türklerin alım gücü azaldı, alamadılar. If you are a middle class person, now you cannot afford many things that you did last year. So there is a, a huge um, change in the life quality. Another big issue in this election is Turkey's political system itself. It's why so many people are talking about this being a potential turning point. Six years ago, Erdogan shifted Turkey from a parliamentary system to a presidential one. That was after a referendum. His argument was that a presidential system would be more efficient. But it's not been as simple as that. The expectation was that the decision-maker process will be quite fast. But just the reverse has happened. He's the sole decision maker. The people who are in government agencies avoid taking risky decisions or important decisions. Erdogan's critics also say that this system gives him too much power without enough checks and balances. And they accuse Erdogan and his party of undermining Turkey's democracy through things like control of the media and weakening institutions like the judiciary. Now, if Kilic Darolu wins, he's promising to move Turkey back to a parliamentary system within the next few years. He's pitching it as a choice between democracy and autocracy. Ancak bunun çaresi mevcut tek adam gitsin, başka bir tek adam gelsin değildir. Tek adam gitsin mi? Evet gitsin. Tek adam rejimi bitsin mi? There is a consensus even among conservatives that there is problems right now. But the question they will be asking, are the other guys going to provide a better alternative to Turkey? So you've got a tanking economy, an intense debate about the political system and Erdogan's record. And then there's the other huge issue affecting Turkey right now, the devastation from the earthquakes back in February. More than 50,000 people died, 2 million lost their homes, and cities were destroyed. Many criticized the government's initial response for being slow and chaotic. Even Erdogan admitted that mistakes were made. Arzu ettiğimiz etkinlikte çalışma yürütemedik. Bunun için sizden helallik istiyorum. The fact that so many buildings collapse also raised questions about the government's enforcement of building regulations. So naturally, the question is, will all of that impact how people vote? Well, it's hard to know. 
because there are reasons why both sides could gain or lose votes over the earthquake issue. People are really angry towards government. There are so many deaths, so there will be protests or uh, votes against the government. Much of the affected area is AKP stronghold. And there in those provinces, the government was able to come out and say, look, we made mistakes on day one and two, but here we are helping you with financial aid, with tents. So I think it has the effect of making people, particularly in, in those areas, coalesce around the state. Bana göre de bu süreçte en güzel, en güzel süreci Tayyip Erdoğan. Arkadaşlarının eksik olmadılar. Hizmetleri tam güzel yani. Biz devletimizden yana bir şikayetimiz yok. Bottom line is this election could go either way. It's really unpredictable. The two main rivals have a staunch support base they can count on and the polls show they're pretty close. Although most put Kılıç Darolu slightly ahead. But remember, they need to pass 50% to win. So that's where a few other factors come in. There are the undecided voters. They make up around 5%, and a lot could happen before election day to swing them one way or the other. And then there's Muharrem Inje, another presidential candidate who's pretty popular. In the 2018 election, he ran against Erdogan as the CHP candidate, but has now formed his own party. He's polling somewhere between five and 10% of the vote, picking up support from opposition voters who are unimpressed by Kilic Darolu and see him as old and out of touch. And then there's the pro-Kurdish party, the HDP, which represents about 10 to 12 percent of the electorate. They're not fielding a presidential candidate, which boosts Kilic Darolu's chances. HDP support uh, to Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu uh, might produce important outcomes. Maybe that's the only way, actually, for Kılıçdaroğlu uh, to win the presidential election. Remember also that parliamentary elections are happening on the same day, and the results of those will also be crucial. Turkish voters may decide to split the ticket. In other words, vote for Erdogan for presidency, but vote for opposition in the parliament, giving them the majority. Or the flip side. Now, most observers reckon that scenario could make political divisions worse and destabilize the country even more when actually most people are desperate for some stability after many difficult years. These are elections that could lead to a huge political change. But whether that'll really make people's lives better is the question most voters will be asking themselves. Is Turkey better off under Erdogan or in a post-Erdogan world? And am I better off under Erdogan or without Erdogan? Irrespective of the final outcome, uh, the dates and months or years ahead uh, will be quite challenging for Turkish people.